morning to the saints of the Hurstful Seventh-day Adventist Church. Good to be back with you today. Uh, today's sermon is entitled Armageddon and the Alamo. And today we'll learn much from comparing the two battles. Firstly, we'll learn what the issues were and who were the players. Secondly, we'll see the strategies involved in both wars. And thirdly, we'll see the final outcomes. So what was the Battle of the Alamo in Mexico all about? Well, in December 1835, in the early stages of the war between Texas and Mexico, where Texas wanted independence, a group of Texan volunteers led by George Collingsworth and Benjamin Malam overwhelmed the Mexican garrison at the Alamo, captured the fort and seized control of San Antonio. So that was the first skirmish. Then in 1836, a year later, following a 13-day siege, Mexican troops under President General Santa Ana reclaimed the town of Alamo for Mexico. It was a famous battle due to the fact that approximately 150 Texans under the co-leadership of William Travis and Jim Bowie, held off the huge Mexican army of over 1,200 trained soldiers for 13 days. All Texans in the Alamo were killed, including the famous Davy Crockett. Preceding these battles, most of the men and women who moved to the Texas Territory were colonizers who came in search of wealth and adventure. They were eager to accept an acre of free land that Mexico was handing out. Uh, in doing so, they agreed to the condition that they convert to Catholicism and become Mexican citizens. However, very few of the settlers did that. At once in Texas, they also realized there was much money to be made in Mexico's cotton industry. Now, their problem of gathering a labor force was quickly solved through slavery, which Mexico had banned. And shocked by the rapidly rising rate of immigration and disgusted by their use of slavery, the Mexican government started slapping on restrictions which the Texans ignored. The Battle of the Alamo was fought over issues like federalism, slavery, immigration rights, the cotton industry, and above all, money. But, but it could also be summed up mainly as two issues. The two issues were land and two opposing laws. And these are the same two issues in the Battle of Armageddon. So there are tremendous lessons we can learn from the Battle of the Alamo as we prepare for the Battle of Armageddon, which I might add brings about God's complete victory over his enemy, Satan. The Battle of Armageddon is initially over two opposing laws, and at a later stage, it is over who will control planet Earth. The creator God who owns it, or a usurper called Lucifer in heaven, but known as Satan here on Earth, who claims it as his domain. So the first thing I need to do is prove to you that Jesus Christ as God created this world, and as such is the rightful owner of this planet. Several Bible verses do this for us, and the one I've chosen is found in Colossians 1 verse 16. For by him, that is Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, all were created by him and for him. So if we look back at history, we find that Jesus did indeed demonstrate his proof of being able to create something from nothing. He brought the dead back to life, and he was able to create a coin in a fish's mouth instantly in order to prove two things, that he was a loyal citizen in Israel who would indeed pay tribute to Caesar as was expected, but by doing it with a miracle, he also proved that he was all he claimed to be, the creator God, and all done in the presence of witnesses. We should also note that Satan, being a created being, cannot create, but he can mutate the things of God, having studied in heaven the secrets of the laboratories of nature. Therefore, the issue is also over who will ultimately own planet Earth, and also whose laws will be the preeminent laws for governing planet Earth. 
the objective laws of the Creator God, or the new and subjective laws of Satan. The Bible tells us who owns this planet in the Bible book called Psalms. Psalm 50 verse 10, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. For the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. So God himself tells us that he is the owner of this world. And when God created this world, and then Adam and Eve, he appointed Adam, the first man on this planet, to be his vice-regent in governing this world on behalf of God. But Satan, who had been banished to this world from paradise and heaven, wrested control of God by seducing God's vice-regent Adam into disobeying God. This meant that Satan, by right of conquest, then became the prince of this world, as Jesus called him in John 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world, that is Satan, be cast out. Satan was the invisible ruler of this world from the time when Adam sinned by disobeying God and for a further 4,000 years until Jesus, the creator God, returned and hid himself in a human body so that we would not be destroyed. Satan then tried to get Jesus Christ, the human, into disobeying God just as he did with Adam. But he failed to tempt Jesus into disobeying God's law, which, had he succeeded, would have made Jesus a sinner. So Satan's failure means that Jesus Christ as God is still the rightful owner of planet Earth. Therefore Satan cannot gain permanent control of Earth. However, the Bible book called Revelation, chapter 17 and verses 12 and 13, tells us through the use of symbols that he succeeds for just a few days in gaining temporary control. And the way he succeeds in temporarily taking over this planet is by trying to tempt everyone, and I mean everyone, to ignore or disobey God's laws. And instead obey the laws that Satan tried to introduce in heaven, which got him kicked out of heaven in the first place. Now, when Mexico insisted that the Texans obey Mexican's law, the Texans chose to fight instead of submit and obey. But the opposite happens when Satan succeeds in getting his laws passed here on earth. So I imagine that about 99.95% of the world's population will obey these man-made laws, and only a tiny group of people will refuse to obey, and there is a reason for this. You will see how this unfolds as we progress through today's message. But suffice to say that it centres on law and land. Now it is a fact that over the centuries countries have gone to war over human affairs and it has not brought about the battle of Armageddon. But Bible prophecy reveals that modern day world political leaders will legislate again Sunday the first day of the biblical and calendar week for family, for leisure purposes, for climate control, and then later for enforced congregational worship activities. But that forthcoming human legislation will replace God's existing Seventh-day Sabbath, which runs from Sunset Friday to Sunset Saturday, and that is what brings about the first part of the Battle of Armageddon. However, let me make something very clear. The world's political leaders, acting on behalf of the world's religious leaders, do not have a mandate from the Creator God to substitute what God has already established as the sacred day. Thus the first part of the Battle of Armageddon will be fought over this issue of whose law is the right law to accept and obey. And when legislators get to legislating Sunday, the first day of the week, for congregational and enforced worship practices, in Psalm 119 verse 126, tells us that this illegitimate legislation will provoke God into direct action. So let us read this for ourselves. Psalm 119 verse 126. It is time for you, Lord, to work. 
because they have made void your law. And the reason he acts is because God's seventh-day Sabbath law, being sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, identifies God as the creator God of the universe, not just the God of planet Earth. Now I have been a bit pedantic in specifying the sunset Friday to sunset Saturday as God's seventh day Sabbath and that's because 6,000 years ago until 2,000 years ago time was measured from sunset to sunset. It was the Romans who changed it to midnight to midnight and around the 1920s the calendar was changed again by the International Standards Organisation they changed the first day of the week from Sunday to Monday and they changed the seventh day of the week from Saturday to Sunday. So I'm trying to make sure that those people around the world who have a wrong calendar that starts on a Monday just go on Google and look for a calendar in England, for example. I looked and found that December 2021 has Sunday as the seventh day of the week but that is not God's sacred day. When I looked at a correct calendar, I found that Sunday is placed correctly as the first day of the week and Saturday is placed correctly as the seventh day of the week. And it is Saturday that God made holy. The first day of the week being Sunday is not God's sacred day because that first day of the week, Sunday, was the first day that God began to create this world. Let us notice that the fourth commandment tells us in Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So notice that the Lord, the Creator God, made heaven and earth. That means that the seventh day, sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, is still God's legitimate memorial flag of the first creation week. And that, by the way, is why we have a seven-day week today. The true Sabbath day is the day that celebrates each week the work of God in making this beautiful world in the previous six days. And the seventh day is the day that God rested on and commanded all to honour as a sacred day. And God reveals in Hebrews 4 verses 9 to 11 the evidence that New Testament Christians are to keep it as well. The Greek word here is sabbatismos and it reads, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his on the seventh day. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. The choice is yours, as Romans 6.16 says, Know ye not that for whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are, to whom you obey. Whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Now let us see what God revealed to an inspired Bible commentator on how Satan plans to demolish God's memorial of creation, being the seventh day Sabbath. It is recorded in a Christian Bible commentary book called Prophets and Kings, page 165 and 166. During the Christian dispensation, the great enemy of man's happiness has made the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment an object of special attack. Satan says, I will work at cross purposes with God. I will empower my followers to set aside God's memorial, the seventh day Sabbath. Thus I will show the world that the day sanctified and blessed by God has been changed. That day shall not live in the minds of the people. I was a Baptist, a Presbyterian, and a Roman Catholic. I never knew about this issue at all in the first 30 years of being a Christian. 
But the Bible said this would happen in Daniel 7 verse 25. And he, that is Satan, via his proxies, shall speak great words against the Most High and think to change times and laws. And so the same Roman proxy that changed the Sabbath to Sunday in 321 AD and ratified it at the Council of Laodicea in 364 AD is the same proxy that will encourage behind the scenes for Protestant religious leaders to agitate for their political leaders to legislate Sunday in place of God's sacred Saturday Sabbath. But justified wrongly by saying it is done for the common good or done for the good of the family or done for the benefit of the climate. But you cannot legislate for the common good of families if it brings on the battle of Armageddon and the wrath of an offended God. So let us continue with the reading from Prophets and Kings, page 165. I will obliterate the memory of it. I will place in its stead a day that does not bear the credentials of God, a day that cannot be a sign between God and his people. So what Satan is referring to here is found in Ezekiel 20 verse 12, in which God tells us that the Sabbath is the sign that God recognizes who are his people. We shall now read. Moreover also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that might know that I am God that sanctify them. But you might be thinking, that was only for the Jews. No, no, a thousand times no. When God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, at the bottom of that mountain were the twelve tribes of Israel, plus a thirteenth group called the mixed multitude, who were not Jews, but Gentiles. Let us continue to understand Satan's plans for attacking God's sacred law. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 165, I will lead those who accept this day, that's the Sunday, to place upon it the sanctity that God placed upon the seventh day which is sunset Friday to sunset Saturday. So folks, that's just plain old rebellion. Through my vice region, I will exalt myself. The first day, which is Sunday, will be extolled, and the Protestant world will receive this spurious Sabbath, which is Sunday, as genuine. And the Sunday-keeping Protestants, along with the Roman Catholics, and the Orthodox churches have been following this spurious Sunday for centuries. Now it is true that we can and should worship God every day of the week, but our acts of worship on a Tuesday, for example, do not make Tuesday a sacred or Sabbath day. It took a holy God to make a holy Sabbath day. Now, do you realize that the Seventh-day Sabbath is God's test of our loyalty to him and comes from one who has power to command, being the creator God of the universe? It's not a suggestion. It is a commandment. Let us now resume our reading from an inspired Bible commentator and see more of what Satan plans to do. Through the non-observance of the Sabbath that God instituted, at sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, I will bring his law into contempt. The words assigned between me and you throughout your generations, I will make to serve on the side of my Sabbath, which is Sunday. Thus the world will become mine, I will be the ruler of the earth. Now the signs are there telling us that movements are afoot to legislate the Sunday, ostensibly for the good of the family or for the common good. But this will be bad because those people who choose to obey man's laws that then causes them to disobey God's laws will receive the wrath of God. Now we shall have a look at a comparison between the Alamo 
and the events that precede the first part of the Battle of Armageddon. General Santa Ana was a dictatorial ruler in Mexico. His people, including the settlers that had moved into that area, resented his rules and leadership style, so they rebelled. General Santa Ana then decided to attack the Alamo to preserve his power base. But there was also a problem between the two Texan leaders, Travis, the commander of the regular force, and Bowie, the commander of the volunteer militia. Bowie threatened to take his men out of the camp. Travis then drew a line in the sand with his sword. He made a great speech, and he invited Bowie and his men to either leave with honour or cross the line and join him. Jim Bowie was the first to get off his horse and walk across the line, and his men dutifully followed, and thus they reunited to defend the Alamo. And this picture on the screen is an acted portrayal of that event. Likewise, the plan of salvation has God drawing a line in the sand when Satan goes too far. You'll see it later in this presentation. So Isaiah 14 verse 13 confirms, For you have said in your heart, I will exalt my throne upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So what is this talking about? Well, Psalm 48 verse 2 helps us to understand this passage better because it says here, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. So this verse makes it clear that the previous slide's reference to the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north is referring to the location of Mount Zion where Satan plans to place his throne. And Mount Zion is in Jerusalem, not in Tel Aviv. So isn't it interesting that the former president, Donald Trump, chose to recognize the capital of Israel as Jerusalem, where Mount Zion is, instead of Tel Aviv, where the embassy was. And so Satan goes on to say, I will be like the Most High. That's Isaiah 14, verse 14. So you've just read from God's own Bible that Satan is wanting to be accepted by humans as God and to receive worship that belongs only to the true God. But you may be thinking, that will never happen because of the secular nature of the world. The world is certainly becoming more secular as the latest statistics show which reveal a serious reduction in Australian church attendance from 44% in 1950 to 16% in 2016. But God's prophetic word reveals that overnight all people in the world are going to suddenly become very religious indeed. So, how will this happen? And where is this prophecy to be found? It's found in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. But worse than that, Satan actually counterfeits the second coming of Jesus Christ, so that he makes out that he is God returned to planet Earth. Jesus warned us about this matter in Matthew 24 verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs, and shall show great signs and wonders, that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Therefore, when the world sees its first real but supernatural being, claiming to be God, then overnight atheists will probably cease to exist. But not realizing that it is a bogus God, what does the Bible say they do? Revelation 13 verse 8 and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, that is Satan, the counterfeit Christ, whose names are not written in God's book of life. So now you can see why this sermon is so important to understand. They worship this false Christ. This is what Satan always wanted, and the world's deceived population 
will be only too quick to put him on a throne. Paul wrote about this around 2,000 years ago of Satan's proxy and later Satan himself seeking the worship that belongs to God alone. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4 Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So Satan does receive worship just for a short time. But when he expects you and me to worship him, our response should match the response of a little boy who said, Back off, devil. I belong to Jesus. And James 4, verses 7 and 8 says we can resist him. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. But many people have fallen for the idea that Satan does not exist. But Jesus knows that he exists. But worse still, if Satan can have people thinking that he is a half man or a half beast, then they won't recognize him when he appears as an angel of light. And when Satan does transform himself into an angel of light, what then will be the problem? The Jews will acclaim this false Christ as the real Messiah because he comes in the manner that they were always looking for originally. And the bulk of the Sunday-keeping Christians will acclaim him as the real Christ, come to set up the thousand years of peace on earth. But the thousand years of peace mentioned in the Bible is to be kept in heaven, not here on earth. And the Muslims will acclaim this being as the Mahdi returned. That is the problem for all of these people as they accept this bogus God who is none other than Satan in disguise. So how will the real God of the universe sort out this big problem of deception? Well, God has a church here on planet earth who are warning the public of what is coming so that when the events happen, people will not be deceived. This is why Jesus said in John 14 verse 29, And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. And which church is giving the final warning messages to the world? It is the Seventh-day Adventist church. A church whose Judaic Christian beliefs match the teachings of God right back to the time of Adam and Eve, who were the original Seventh-day Sabbath keepers. As Jude 1 verse 3 says, Beloved, I exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. So how can people who do not believe in the Seventh-day Sabbath defend the holiness of that day? They cannot, can they? God's obedient people who have been keeping the true Sabbath for 6,000 years, are the ones who can and who will defend God's memorial of the first creation week. The seven-day week comprises six secular days for man to earn a living, being the same six days that God worked, and one seventh day of the week being the same day that God rested for family time, congregational worship, and extra rest over and above the normal nightly sleep. So that tells me that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a perfect right to be the defenders of the faith once delivered to the saints. The modern-day Sunday law has not yet been legislated, but Pope Francis believes it's not too far away. Let us now have another look at an interesting thing that happened at the Alamo. When the settlers at the Alamo were about to be attacked by the Mexican army, William Travis spoke words of encouragement to his little garrison of defenders. He also wrote a letter seeking reinforcements, and the postscript at the bottom of that letter said, The Lord is on our side. But all 150 men were killed, including Colonel William Travis. The point I am making is that death does not necessarily represent failure. 
One only needs to consider the martyrs who over the last 6,000 years sought to defend God's teachings, even at the loss of their lives. And when the usurper Satan comes, making out he's the real God returned, there will be more martyrs as we alert the world. But that is not failure, for God will resurrect the faithful saints if they remain true to God. But we do need to be reminded of the fact that God is counting on us to defend his memorial of creation and to defend his name, his honour, his reputation, his character, and above all, his law of love that governs the universe. For that law is what Satan attacked in heaven. And the Holy Scriptures reveal that Satan will be continuing those attacks once he presents himself as the counterfeit Christ here on earth. And do be assured that God is ready for that day. God has many ways of helping us, including the arrival of the second Pentecost, which is sent at the time when we need it the most. And God promises to join us in the battle of Armageddon, and to provide us with the help we will need in order to be victorious over Satan. And one of the great tools God has already provided us with is the visions of future events as set out in the inspired writings we call the Spirit of Prophecy. These writings explain the Bible doctrines so clearly for us. In one of those books called The Great Controversy, page 624, God has revealed through his chosen and inspired Bible commentator the following information about Satan's arrival as the false Christ. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan will personate Christ. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air, Christ has come, Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him. And while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them, he heals the diseases of the people. And then in his assumed character of Christ, claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. And that's why he says here, the world will become mine, I will be the ruler of the earth. Those words amaze the secular world, but they don't amaze God or Seventh-day Sabbath keepers. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day, which is sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. So we should not be surprised at these events unfolding in the near future. Christ warned us in Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18 about the false Christ's coming and deceiving the whole world about the change of the Sabbath. Matthew 5, verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. I have not come to destroy but to fulfill. Remember this, as long as heaven and earth last, the least point or the smallest detail of the law will not be done away with. But the counterfeit Christ, being the devil in disguise, succeeds in getting Sunday legislated. And thus we read of Satan's boast found in Prophets and Kings, page 166. We read it a moment ago. Thus the world will become mine. I will be the ruler of the earth. The bogus Christ said he changed the seventh day Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And because people think it is God telling them that, they naturally obey. And that is how Satan becomes the ruler of this world just for a short time. But the real Jesus Christ said, as we just read, I will not be changing one iota of the Ten Commandment law. And therefore I ask this question, who will you serve? God and his law, or men and their traditions? So here are the three ways you can identify Satan, the bogus Christ, when he comes. 
Now, you may want to write these down, or you can obtain a digital or DVD copy of this message by e emailing me at my email address, which is blessingsandwarnings at gmail.com. Now, here are the three clues to watch for that will help you identify the bogus Christ when he arrives. Clue number one, Satan walks up and down the earth, but the real Christ does not touch the earth at his second coming. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 to 18 tells us that. Christ's feet do touch the earth at his third coming. Zechariah 14 verse 4 tells us that. The second clue, the real Christ just told us that he will never be changing his law. Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18. But Satan, the bogus Christ, will say that he changed the fourth commandment, the Sabbath law, to Sunday. He also expects everyone to obey that Sunday law. And the change to the Sabbath is referred to in Daniel 7, verse 25. Clue number three. The bogus Christ is not allowed to come in the manner of the real Christ. The real Christ comes back surrounded by 10,000 times 10,000 holy angels and the righteous dead and the righteous living meet Christ in the sky. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 16 to 18. So now that you know what to look for, prophecy also states that the entire world will accept the bogus Christ except those who heed these warnings. So picture the scene, 7.8 billion people on this planet end up adoring and worshipping a false god. Whilst many among the 20 million Seventh-day Adventists, although few in number, are saying no, this is the bogus Christ. Now you wouldn't think that this is the way to win friends and influence people, would you? But Jesus warned the people of his day and thousands were saved. Likewise, we, with the help of God's promised Holy Spirit power, will indeed see many people who will indeed be saved from the prophesied satanic counterfeit coming and also from the prophesied Sunday legislation. Therefore, knowing that our messages will save thousands makes this work so worthwhile. Now, in terms of the few numbers available to defend the faith once delivered to the saints, there is a similarity to the position that occurred at the Battle of the Alamo. William Travis also had only a small militia, numbering about 150 men, facing a professionally trained Mexican army of over 1,200 men. We too will be small in number, but end up fighting for defending God's Seventh-day Sabbath, and we're up against the rest of the world who will have been deceived into thinking that they are following the real Jesus Christ. They don't realise they are following Satan, the bogus Christ. Now, unlike William Travis, who did not know how the Battle of the Alamo would end up, we do know what the outcome of the Battle of Armageddon is going to be. God wins the war after first sending reinforcements to the side of his people who are trying to uphold and protect God's law including the Seventh-day Sabbath. And we also know that there will be martyrs this side of the seven last plagues falling, but there will be no martyrs after the seven last plagues start to fall. Now when the Sunday law is legislated, we have been given special counsel, which states that Seventh-day Adventists can run evangelistic programs on the Sundays, in addition to worshipping God on the seventh day. We do that so that we cause no undue offence to the laws of the land. This perplexes Satan and the world's political and religious leaders when they see that we are honouring their Sunday law but still worshipping God on the true Seventh-day Sabbath. And so inducements are offered to us to renounce the Seventh-day Sabbath. This was shown by God to an inspired Bible commentator 
and recorded in the book called The Great Controversy, page 607. As the controversy extends into new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light lest it should shine upon their Sunday-keeping flocks. I remember meeting a Sunday-keeping minister who said to me, Nowhere in the New Testament are we commanded to keep the seventh-day Sabbath holy. I simply said to him, Go and read Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 1 to 11. It's all there in black and white. And we'll be keeping the Saturday Sabbath in heaven as well, according to Isaiah 66 verse 23. So what is stopping you from keeping it now, here on earth, and demonstrating your loyalty to God? So let us continue our reading. By every means at their command, they'll endeavour to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The Church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, Papists and Protestants unite. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. They will be threatened with fines and imprisonment, and some will be offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. And our response will be, show us from the word of God our error. And of course they cannot do that from the Holy Bible. Those who are arraigned before the courts make a strong vindication of the truth. And some who hear them are led to take their stand to keep all of the commandments of God. Thus light will be brought before thousands who otherwise would know nothing of these truths. And some will be offered positions of influence and other rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. Do you notice the inducements that will be offered to get us to renounce the keeping of God's true seventh-day Sabbath? Positions of influence, rewards and advantages. Sadly, some of God's people will accept the inducements and give up the faith. So here is a question. Why accept the inducements in order to extend our life on this earth if it means we lose eternal life? Surely it is better to value eternal life that never ends so that we can enjoy a perfect life in perfect bodies doing perfect and wonderful things and enjoy the companionship of God the holy angels, and our fellow believers whom we love, who also get there. Always remember that heaven and eternal life is the ultimate prize, and hellfire and eternal death is the ultimate penalty. And it all hinges on the decisions that we make. God does the saving, but we do the choosing. So make wise choices today. My advice to the saints is to put great value on living forever and therefore to be a wise saint who rejects any evil inducement to renounce God's seventh-day Sabbath here on earth. Now here is a report that I have not been able to confirm but it does illustrate very nicely the difference between good and evil inducements. The cooks at the Alamo reported that their meat supply was getting short. In those days they had no refrigerators or deep freezers. So William Travis negotiated with a farmer to get fresh meat supplies. The farmer, who was a loyal Texan, said they could have 400 steers free of charge if Travis did one simple thing. Talk about the old times. And according to the story, he did talk about the old times. The point of this story is that the Alamo's good inducement did not affect their eternal salvation, whereas the evil inducements to renounce our faith in the true God's seventh-day Sabbath 
has the capacity to affect our salvation unless we refuse the inducement. Although some will accept the inducements offered to Seventh-day Adventist Christians and thus leave the faith, many Seventh-day Adventist Christians will refuse to accept the inducements offered and that then leads to the fulfilment of another prophecy found in Revelation 13 verse 17 and it says, And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark which is legislated and enforced Sunday keeping. So the screws get tightened and Satan's proxies seeking to enforce the Sunday sacredness move from inducements to a financial embargo against Seventh-day Sabbath keepers who refuse to give up God's Seventh-day sacred Sabbath. Now Satan said he'd do this, so let us read of it now. Maranatha, page 162. Through my vice-regent I will exalt myself. The first day Sunday will be extolled. Human laws will be made so stringent that man and woman will not dare to observe the seventh day Sabbath. For fear of wanting food and clothing, they will join with the world in transgressing God's law. The earth will be holy under my dominion. That's what Satan says. But God has told us what to do to prepare for this buying and selling crisis. I have a sermon on that, so email me the address I gave if you want further details. But when the buying and selling crisis doesn't stop God's people from loyal obedience to God's seventh-day Sabbath, then the screws get tightened even further. Revelation 13 verse 15 tells us, that there will be issued a death decree against Seventh-day Sabbath keepers. But here is the good news. It's too late for God's enemies to act upon that death decree, even though they try. Because by that time, God will have drawn a line in the sand, and he does that by sealing his people for eternity. And from that moment onwards, God and his angels then protect his people from that death decree. So God's people have nothing to fear. As I said earlier, there will be no martyrs after the saints are sealed because no one can change sides thereafter. The saved will be saved forever and the lost will be lost forever. But let us get back to the time before the angels defend us, before the saints are sealed and the seven last plagues fall. Does the Bible make it clear when God steps in personally to help us? Yes, it does. We read this verse earlier today. It's time for you, Lord, to work, because they have made void your law. Psalm 119, verse 126. So what does God do? He allows the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses to be found. Recorded in Manuscript 122, 1901. And he gave unto Moses two tables of stone, written by the finger of God, Nothing written on those tables could be blotted out. The precious record of the law was placed in the Ark of the Testament and is still there, safely hidden from the human family. In God's appointed time, he will bring forth these tables of stone to be a testimony to all the world against the disregard of his commandments and against the idolatrous worship of a counterfeit Sunday Sabbath. What a dramatic event that will be. So when Satan says he changed the Sabbath to Sunday, God says through his messengers, No, you are Satan, the false god, legislating a false Sabbath. Thus the world will be brought to take a stand on one side or the other. Now because God has his people in all faiths and all denominations, his church which is seen by God to be spiritual Israel, is instructed to call out those genuine believers who are still in what God calls spiritual Babylon to do the following. It's found in Revelation 18 verse 4. Come out of her, that spiritual Babylon, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. But here is depicted an urgent appeal from God for his people to come out of spiritual Babylon before it is too late that had come into spiritual Israel 
that still loves and obeys the true God. In this way, they won't receive the seven last plagues. This appeal from the true God is his way of making sure that we all act on this last warning and be saved from the plagues. Now, just as Travis of the Alamo put a line in the sand and his men rallied to the call, so God does the same. God draws a line in the sand and he says, Enough is enough. By that time, God's true people will have rallied behind the true God no matter what. See for yourself, as we refer to the inspired writings again, that enable us to understand God's plans for these times just ahead of us. Maranatha, page 262. When the time fully comes, that iniquity, that is sin, shall have reached the stated boundary of God's mercy, his forbearance will cease. Then it will be seen what a tremendous thing it is to have worn out the divine patience. This crisis will be reached when the nations shall unite in making void God's law. The substitution of the false Sabbath for the true Sabbath is the last act in the drama. Thus the issue of who receives worship comes right out into the open. It centres around the commandments of the true God versus the commandments of men legislated at the behest of Satan, the counterfeit God. Therefore the choices the world makes on this issue tell the true God whether we are obedient and thereby loyal or disobedient and thereby disloyal and rebellious. And as a result of these choices, if we are obedient and loyal, we will receive eternal life and end up living in a fabulous city in heaven whose builder and maker is the true God. No more sin, no more suffering, no more pain, no more death, no more hospitals, no more funeral parlours. On the other hand, if we are disobedient and thereby disloyal and rebellious, we will be destroyed at the second coming of the true Jesus Christ. Let us continue our reading of Maranatha, page 262. When the substitution becomes universal, God will reveal himself. When the laws of men are exalted above the laws of God, he will arise in his majesty and will shake terribly the earth. He will come out of his hiding place to punish the inhabitants of the world. God's long suffering has ended. The world has rejected his mercy, despised his love, and trampled upon his law. So that is the issue in a nutshell. Two laws. One that is the true God's law that governs the universe. The other is the false God's law that only governs planet Earth for a few days. Remember these two issues, land and two opposing laws. So from our message today, you can see that Satan, the false god, succeeds to get his Sunday law legislated worldwide, but the world is then destroyed by the true God. Likewise, the garrison at the Alamo was destroyed, but out of that battle came the new land called the Republic of Texas, and then after that Texas joined as a state within the United States of America. But the Battle of Armageddon is currently a spiritual battle of Armageddon, which we've already looked at, and it is over God's law and Satan's attempts to change God's law. Now I mentioned before that there are two parts to the battle of Armageddon, and the first part was over the law of God versus the laws of men, instigated by an evil enemy of the true God, and we have looked at that. Satan ultimately loses the battle over the seventh-day Sabbath as versus the first-day Sunday laws. But there is still the battle over who owns planet Earth that is yet to be finalised. How does this battle get finalised and who wins it? Well, after planet Earth is destroyed at the second coming of the genuine Jesus Christ, God's people spend a thousand years with God and the angels in heaven. Then after the thousand years there, a mighty thing happens. God, plus the good angels, plus the saints, 
and the holy city, leave heaven and come back to planet earth, which for the last thousand years has been in a state of total devastation. So here's a summary of the final battle of Armageddon over land ownership. It's a summary only. The third coming of Jesus with the saints is recorded in Zechariah 14 verse 5. This is the third coming of Jesus. Number two, the holy city settles on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, verses 4 and 10. Thirdly, the Godhead plus the good angels and all the righteous ones and the holy city come back to earth, Matthew 25, verse 31. The wicked dead are raised and thus Satan is loosed, Revelation 20, verses 5 and 7. Satan deceives the entire world, Revelation 20, verse 8. Satan now has a huge army that he can command. He tells them that the holy city is rightfully his. And because they greatly outnumber the citizens living inside the holy city, Satan convinces his army that they can take the city by force. And that is when Satan and the wicked are destroyed by fire. Revelation 20 verse 9. God wins that war also, and thus the new heavens and the new earth are occupied solely by loving and obedient angels and loving and obedient humans who then can live with God for eternity. All evil and all rebellious created beings will then have been destroyed forever and sin and rebellion will never arise again. May that be a source of great encouragement for you all today. It only remains for you to make a conscious and correct decision to ensure that you are on the right side. May God bless you all and your loved ones today and forevermore. Amen.